it's a real privilege to be back here at Cramner. Uh, I do have a couple of slides that I, I'd like us to use. And uh, go um, it's up to you. Should I do it? I'll do it. That's probably just a bit easier because otherwise, I have a friend called John Hill who has this fantastic ability to click two hands. I can't do it. So uh, when people come to church, you can click and they change the slides. Unfortunately, I'm not that savvy. Um, but anyway, my name's Mark. It is a real privilege to be with you today. Um, you don't have to call me Reverend as Lizzie Candy did. Uh, in my church, they call me R. Mark. And then for me, that's the best title they could give me. Um, and I'll explain why I believe that is later. But Mark is fine. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about me before I kind of move on to my paper. Um, I am fascinated and passionate and driven about helping people encounter the risen Jesus. That's why I do what I do. And so I'm looking at today's kind of seminar time or talk time from the perspective of a practitioner. Um, I've done a little bit of theology and my friend Nigel has helped me with some of that. He's been very gracious with his time. Um, but I wouldn't say that I'm a, a theologian in the classical sense. I'm an evangelist and a practitioner. Um, not that you can't be both but I heavily lean towards the latter. I'm not really a classically trained theologian. Uh, so just to say, I'll be speaking and referencing a few books actually today. Um, one is Northern Church, Northern Gospel. Uh, another one is Models of Contextual Theology by Stephen Bevins. Um, you may hear some words from this book uh, called The Faith of the English. The author is sat amongst us. And I have another book in my bag that I forgot to pull out called Fuzzy Church, um, which is written by Nigel and Ellie Rooms, uh, Ellie, uh, Ellie Watt and Nigel Rooms, also here. who's also in, actually presenting in the other room. That said, shall we begin? Um, so as we begin my presentation, I would like you to consider, I don't know where we go. And we're gonna to talk today about Mining the gospel, sharing faith in post-industrial northern contexts, and kind of my experiences in that. Before we begin, I'd like us to look at this picture on the screen. It's called the Bridge to Nowhere. It's an actual bridge in a place called Honduras. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Honduras. But this bridge used to be at the centre of where that river is, or the river used to be actually used to run under the bridge. It served a purpose, it fed the community, it was a place of life, it was used, it was great. Then there was a hurricane, things changed, the world moved on, and this bridge that was at the centre of a society, at the centre of that place in the world, became the bridge to nowhere. It stopped being relevant, it stopped being used. And it suddenly became not necessarily irrelevant, but it became a monument to something that once was. I wonder, is that the same for our evangelism and our evangelism strategies today? I do wonder, I feel that when we think of some of our churches, and when I spend time training church leadership teams, often on evangelism and, and doing stuff with them, I often come and ask them the question, what are we pretending that we don't know about our mission and our proclamation of the gospel? What are we pretending that we don't know about the way we're doing evangelism, the way we're reaching our people? I think that's a really important question that we, we need to wrestle with, maybe in our churches and with our teams. And here are some problems that I think that the church is facing in light of this recent shift. If you know anything about our culture, and I'm sure our sociologist friend can speak into this in a little while, you know, society has moved on quite recently and quite rapidly in the last 20 years. If you're a Trekkie among us, it's kind of like we've gone through a wormhole, which was COVID, and we can't come back. The world has changed. The river's moved on. And it kind of feels like we as a church need to move on with that. So what do we do? How do we do that? And what are some of the issues that we face? 
I want to speak what about what Brett Bevins calls the transfer, um, the translational model of contextual theology, just for a couple of minutes. As someone who has worked as an evangelist and in church leadership in a number of contexts in the post-industrial North, Wigan, Warrington, Salford, Bolton, latterly St. Helens and Liverpool, I begin to notice that the following notions. Firstly, that the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't broken. The gospel is not broken. However, the way that many people outwork it and proclaim it probably is in relation to the world that we live in. The way that we see the gospel at work in our communities, the kind of seeds of the gospel that I'll speak about shortly, actually are things that I think we need to focus on more than our classical proclamation um, that's often kind of emphasized in this translational model. Those of you that may know me know that I'm a card-carrying kind of charismatic evangelical. I love a tambourine. I love a flag. I love a guitar. And, um, and though I can't play either of them, and when I wave my flag, I look like a madman. I love it. I'm a fully-fledged charismatic evangelical. I even like singing um, that um, Stuart Townsend song that he doesn't sing anymore. Um, I forgot the name of it, but... I'm a charismatic evangelical at heart, yet my missiology has become increasingly kind of Anglo-Catholic as I've been working through this stuff and concentrating more and learning about ministry of presence through reading people such as Sam Wells, through reading some of Nigel's work and others. So here's some of the issues that I think the translational model presents us. And the translational model is essentially a not, not exclusively, but a manner of cut and paste, um, kind of, will take some things and just from one area of scripture or from one aspect of the church and just kind of paste it. It feels like Bevan's, um, sorry, it feels like what Bevan's calls a translational model of contextual mission has in many ways lost um, its power in the church in the post-industrial north. A simple copy and paste approach of our ministries, preaching and projects has left many people with a lack of creativity or entrepreneurial vision in regard to the way that the mission and evangelism of our churches are at work. We want to see people saved. Well, let's just run an alpha course, pick that course off the shelf. That'll do. I have nothing against alpha. I've used alpha in the past myself. Uh, but what happens when alpha doesn't work? In my context in par, St. Helens, asking somebody to commit to a nine or a 16 week alpha course just isn't practical. Where I work, people live chaotic lives. We have chaotic um, families and, and there's a lot of deprivation. Asking somebody to commit to a nine week course is alien to them. You might as well be asking them to kind of run to the moon and back. But of course, this is just a mere symptom of a larger issue that maybe we can talk about later. Um, and some larger issues that I won't have time to discuss today. The second issue that the transformational model faces is that it allows for a form of gospel proclamation, a, long, a form of gospel proclamation that lacks authenticity. So you're struggling. Uh, well, let me quote Jeremiah 29, 11 to you. Did God say that once? Oh, well, yeah. Does God say that every time a person comes to me in crisis? I'm not so sure. In fact, I'm not convinced of that. The translational model and that way of thinking, I'll just copy and paste this, attach this to this pastoral situation, and that'll work because it worked over there. That's not ministry. That's not the gospel. And while, of course, yet there are those... It, uh, there are those that use this well. It does give priests and church leaders an excuse not to be authentic um, and, you know, work to the needs of their communities. The translational approach allows for a difference, a division to be kept between priests and their parishioners. And in a world that's crying out for authenticity and holiness and relationship, it's such a shame that so many of us have been taught theologically and missionally to think this way. I could go on, but for the sake of time, I'll move on. So 
what am I what am I proposing? What am I talking about here today? Well, I think my research that I've done is currently heading um, in a distinction kind of of two way two aspects of reviewing and reforming my missiology and my views on evangelism. It's my experience that a, a more anthropological approach to missions and evangelism works well in the post-industrial North. For me, I feel that this is owing to the relational aspect of the model, which seems to lend itself to the discovery of what Bevan's calls and others have called the seeds of the gospel. As I've ministered across the region in different contexts, I've noticed two key themes which have been uh, consistent in support of what um, of what rooms and what's called a, a northern gospel or wrote about being a, a potentially northern gospel. And these areas are uh, family and an approach which has been built on authenticity and communal integration. At my church, um, I very rarely call ourselves a church, we're a family. Family values and our church, our culture is strongly built on them. At the church I currently, we base our culture and our missional priorities on the concepts of family. In the, in the industrial north, family is a massive concept. It's a massive idea. And this has taken to the extreme that I, I rarely talk or refer, refer, us, refer to us as a church these days. Of course, we are a church, but I also call us a family. My church referred to me as our Mark. I'm not Reverend Mark. There's not that barrier between us. And for me, that is the best title they could give me. I feel as it's been a development of our culture, along with a strong outward facing missiology that allows us to reach into our culture. And our church in the last nine months has grown by around 300%. In seven months, we've gone from having 11 old people to quite a uh, diverse community of around 42 people we had the other Sunday, which may not seem like a lot, but in my context, that's massive. We've had to start a kids church alongside some other projects that we run to deal with the need and the support to support the young families that are coming, all based around this idea of family and being belonging to something greater than oneself. And in the post-industrial North, family is a hugely important topic. And the breakdown of many families, particularly in my context, um, sorry, particularly in my context, has provided a wonderful uh, but sad opportunity for people to come to a safe place and they cry out for that. And the church has become that for them. Seeing church as family has allowed for me to lead the community well, to have frank and honest discussions with people around pastoral issues. They call me our Mark and they see me as the head of the family. So when I speak to them, about the way that they're treating their brothers and sisters within our family, it gives me license to have those conversations and people not to be offended. People belong and believe something greater than themselves and our kind of family values that my community is based on have seen our growth develop and our mission grow strongly. Secondly, I wanted to talk about authentic relationships just briefly or what I'm calling or choosing or beginning to think of as actually more radical holiness. I attended a New Wine Leaders Conference a couple of weeks ago and Bishop Ruth spoke about radical holiness, about the idea of true holiness being that God comes down and gets involved in the mess of life and changes it. In God, the light isn't changed by the mess, but the light infects and changes the mess and brings light into that situation. It's been this approach to be fully in, to try and fully integrate myself into the community as much as possible to assimilate and become one of them. So the better they've given me the title of our mark, which means so much to me and so much to our mission. Um, I'm aware of time. So what I'll do is I will finish with a quick story and maybe provide a couple of things for us to discuss. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I... One of my parishioners um, left her abusive partner. She has five children. Well, she had four children, one in the oven, so to speak. She left him because she's heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
and is believing for a better future for herself and her family. When she left him, she went into hospital to have the child that she was bearing. And to all the people in my congregation, out of all her family, and to all the people around her, and she did have a lot of people around her, she chose my wife to take her to the hospital to sit with her while she gave birth to this child. A couple of hours later, I was contacted by the social services asking me, would me and my wife take her youngest child, Esmeralda, for a few hours? Um, the comments that were made by the social services were, we've spoken to Haley. you and Laura are the safest people she knows. That, to me, is what it means to have family or see church as family, to have that radical holiness, to be at the centre of our church communities, be at the centre of our community, to bring light into those places so that others may see hope as a result of that. To see the seeds of the gospel of hope, of family, of humour at times as well, but most importantly of radical holiness or authenticity brought into mainstream, that we would affect our communities and those around us so that people like Haley would choose to come to Jesus, trust us and begin a discipleship journey. That's one of many stories I'd love to share more with you later. I'm aware of time and I want to honour that. So as I finish, I'd just like to leave us with a couple of questions that maybe we could reflect on during our discussion in a little while. What are the seeds of the gospel that you are seeing in your local contexts? Maybe we can tease out a little bit more what that might look like. What do you feel are the strengths and weaknesses of seeing church as family in the north? That's a massive thing, particularly post-industrial contexts. And how do you feel about God using authenticity or, as I'm beginning to see it, more as radical holiness as a means to share and outwork the gospel? That, as John quotes at the end of his gospel, we may believe and people may have life in his name. Thank you for your time.